Sention webinar series, a deep dive into the CIS benchmarks. I'm your host, Zach Kromkowski over from Sention. Got my co-host, Rich McGraw here from CIS. And we have a couple special guests today. We got Charity Otwell also joining from CIS, more on the control side. So I'll let her introduce herself on that. We also have the very known Felicia King, um, security architect, CISO, owner, president of her own company. Really honored to have you here. Can't wait to dive into these technical stories with you because if there's anyone who has hardened devices and prioritizes the fundamentals, it's you. So uh, don't don't forget about the InfoSec rabbits, information security rabbits. Can't forget <laughs> that. We all got to have our, our differentiator thing. And I'd say that makes you the most memorable for me, Felicia. <laughs> But, um, you know, I really appreciate everyone being here. We do have cats on the call as well. But um, That is one very thin cat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Felicia, do you mind just kind of kicking off the episode, introducing your background, and also just answer the question why you prioritize the fundamentals? Well, I, I prioritize, yeah, let me start with that one because <laughs> to me it's a bit of a hot thing. Like I did this fantastic webinar on uh, the CIS community defense model, and I wasn't talking about any specific technology. The as a CISO and, and just so people know where I'm coming from, I'm not a small CISO. I do CISO work for extremely large multinational organizations. So from that CISO perspective, I'm constantly dealing with this aspect of how do you get executive management teams to buy into anything, really? And it all comes down to return on security investment. People are asking, where do we start? Where do we focus our energies and all of that? And they feel like they have to boil the ocean. You don't. And in that webinar I did where I was talking about the CIS community defense model, combined with my own approaches, of course, I was talking about how you, you know, the CIS community defense model basically has a pivot table in it. And it says, look, you've got this, these MITRE attack framework items, you've got these attacks and techniques, and you can mitigate those with these controls. Okay. So where do you start from? At the top of the list is the answer, right? If you look at the very top of the list, the, to the top five, I swear to God, if you did the top five, you would probably never get hacked. Just do the top five, right? And, and my position is, why on earth would you waste your time with something other than the top five until you've completely locked down and nailed your organization's efficacy of delivery of those top five? There's now, return I, on security investment. And in many cases, you don't even have to buy any products for that. No, now, I, I, I'd have to double check this document to see the whole top five. But, you know, all the hype is AI technology, EDR, and a lot of these reactive one. Does that fall into this top five list or is it no. really just the fundamentals? No, it, it's the fundamentals, right? It's the fundamentals. Like um, if we seriously cannot remove local administrator from end users, can we really have an intellectually honest discussion about anything else? Like really, why are we wasting our time on something else if we haven't been able to fundamentally address that? Yeah. It's now, about the basics, right, Felicia? Uh, yeah. I'm curious about the trends you're also seeing in the market and, and Charity, I gotta let you introduce yourself before we get too deep, but Felicia, you're, you brought up a really good thought. I work with a lot of MSPs. That's where Sention lives. I think that's where everyone in this room lives. and a lot of the time I'll see them have these next gen antivirus, these EDR solutions, but not a lot of the times will they have even a hardened baseline or a partially hardened baseline. Is there a trend in the market that EDRs and reactive solutions are more prioritized? And, and, and what do you think about that? I think what happens is that the entire MSP industry is plagued by lemming syndrome. And that lemming syndrome is they go to these events and they sit on forums and then they get into uh, gesticulative debates about is this technology better than that? And they're fundamentally not even starting from the right question, the right set of requirements is what actually is our paradigm? What risks are we attempting to mitigate? And so when they, I literally have a guy now who's trying to hire me for CISO consulting services to help him put together his technology stack for his business. He has no documented paradigm. I'm like, you have to actually have a documented paradigm that says these are the risks that I see them. This is how I'm envisioning how to mitigate those risks. This is how all of these technologies and our human processes have synergy and how they work together. So 
you know, they're chasing the shiny objects, right? And then mm -hmm. you also have a whole other problem of a good chunk of the industry is trying to gin up demand that doesn't exist. Okay, like look at the whole sock. You gotta have a sock. You gotta mitigate your liability by having a sock. Okay, I have enormous customers. Does anybody give a crap about a sock? No, they don't. You know why? Because they haven't mastered their fundamentals yet. So really, are we gonna get value from throwing money at a sock? But this is exactly what you see the entire MSP space doing is they're like, well, I got to have this. I have to mitigate this liability. And it's like, no, actually, if you just sit down and you write your statements of work correctly and you engage honestly with your customers and list out these are the customer responsibilities and these are the risks, yep. these are the risks we mitigate. And by you not having your own policies and not defining your own requirements, you're accepting these risks and we don't mitigate these for you. Right. And by being just very direct and honest with clients in writing and seeking to put them in a respectful, informed decision making process, you absolutely will mitigate your liability. You don't need to go get a SOC service. You don't need to have, you know, an outsourced MDR. You, you need to do all kinds of other things correctly. And, and so that's what the MSP industry does from my perspective is they are always talking about the shiny objects instead of challenging themselves in their paradigm. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I love think, the passion. I think that's an interesting evolution almost like they, it sounds like there was almost a stage completely skipped over because of those shiny objects, the marketing dollars that, that are spent, right? It makes things look easy, right? I mean, it's who doesn't like want a single don't bullet? have the shiny object, you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. So yep. I, I love all, I love all of that. And I do want to go back to charity and allow you to introduce yourself a little bit. I know Felicia touched on policy and governance a little bit. So if you don't mind introducing yourself, your role at CIS, um, but also a couple responses to the policy and governance side. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my background is in governance. So Felicia and I had a few moments to, to kind of um, find that find that similarity before we began the webinar. So um, yes, I can tell that she is governance minded and so am I. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I spent the last 18 years in the financial services industry. So um, from very, very small banks to um, uh, top 50 banks, right? So by the end, um, end of my banking career, it was a $50 billion bank in assets. 7,000 associates and around 500 retail, uh, retail locations. I am only telling you all of these fun facts because um, my role at, um, at the bank was the director of IT governance. So I sat right in IT, reported directly to our CIO. What IT governance meant for the enterprise that I was with was um, three different things. So um, IT governance being process governance around I all IT services, right, from, from start to finish. That, that's going to that's gonna look at things from a practice level, right? Information security as a service, network service as a service, server services as a service. And so what my team did is go in and look at those processes um, and the controls that um, supported them and um, any engineering or re-engineering that needed to take place to ensure, you know, better audit results. But not only that, and this is this goes to a little bit of Felicia's point as well, is the end user's experience um, of those services that are being offered to the enterprise. So that was one piece. Second piece, I had all of business continuity. So business continuity, disaster recovery, incident management, and crisis management for all 500 locations and 7,000 employees. Um, so um, I happily walked away from incident management, even though I know a lot about it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a hard area that's in fun. financial. <laughs> Work-life balance has gotten exponentially better. Um, so, uh, at least third, she doesn't know that. <laughs> right. um, third, um, third arm of of what I did was a little bit lighter in maturity. Like I said, I started um, at a very small bank that grew and grew, grew and grew. So I went through um, seven or eight uh, mergers. And um, if you've ever been through a merger, you know that you pretty much start from ground up, especially holding the uh, best practice adoption charge, you know, why you should do this and, and how. And um, so uh, I, I was able to stand up um, a process architecture group as well, where we looked at the technology lifecycle stacks, what's end of life, what's emerging, what are we supporting, what resources um, are supporting those, um, which turned into a little bit of enterprise architecture light. I would not consider that enterprise architecture architecture, but sometimes it was seen as such. So it was it was in its infancy. 
Um, so um, was able to do that for a, for a fairly large um, financial services industry. Now, I have been at CIS as the director of critical security controls just since May. So just six months. Awesome. It's definitely a change from working in IT, right? Like I said, work-life balance was was a part in that. Um, but also, um, because of just just the passion and the torch that I've held for best practice, um, not only um, recommendation but adoption and the why of that, right? Like. I can spout off things from COVID or NIST or any other regulatory framework that I've had to ingrain in my mind over the years. But really, I was able to see that from building it, the, the why we do that, the accountability that comes with that and the misunderstanding of it as well. You know, well, I thought I was checking this box. Doesn't that give me X, Y, Z? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> so um, coming over to CIS and getting the call to join a team, um, uh, like Zach said, I work I'm directly for Phyllis Lee, who is, who is very, very well known and very well respected, um, getting the call from her to, to be on the best practice framework design and uh, maintenance and implementation and publication side. Absolutely. I feel like I've been paid to, to, to hold the charge for 20 years to, to, to browbeat folks to do so. So, I mean, you know, um, uh, being on the uh, on the content development side of, of being able to really do what I feel passionately about makes a difference, especially if you understand it and everything that supports those controls um, can be really, really powerful. And knowing that CIS has not only a, a, a reach in, inside the U.S., but something I was surprised about whenever I took the position six months ago was the majority of our downloads. Or right, it might be right at 51%. So we'll say half okay. of our downloads are external to the US. So, you know, having a reach I didn't know that. is That's... pretty cool, you know. So um, I've gushed about it enough. Common I'm sense is international. <laughs> <laughs> that that that's the common language between the world. That that is awesome to hear. And and I will note with the international um partners we work with, they do reference CIS and they want some extra cross mappings. But uh, I think you guys well, need a little yeah, bit more time to get those done. That, there's new regs <laughs> coming out in April of 2024 um, for all EU organizations. You know, they're trying to have a common level of cybersecurity across all um, organizations in the EO. And uh, we're part right. of that framework. You know, we're called out specifically as element of compliance and mm -hmm. um, things like that. So, you know, international is large for us and growing. And a lot of that's regulatory uh, driven. So we're so happy to have Charity with us. You know, she brings such a wealth of background as, as you've just heard, and she's already had a huge impact at CIS. And what's really cool about our controls too is, and the benchmarks is, these are um, threat informed recommendations. You know, the, 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 this is not a lab exercise. Well, it is a lab exercise because we test them against the MITRE framework. But it's it's not something you know. Th these are recommendations that are thoughtful, meaningful, and we're proud to have uh, Charity curating those for us at this point. It's awesome to hear. Now, something um, Charity and Felicia, I feel like both have experience with because I saw Felicia's reaction when you said it, Charity. But um, box checking and selling into that executive team and that board. I know Felicia, you're. You're in a little bit of a different position than a lot of the MSPs I work with and virtual CISOs because you are working larger scale, right? But I'm sure you have a lot smaller ones mixed in. But um, I'll hand it to Felicia first to respond to Charity. But what's your experience with checkboxing and, and to take this more direct, selling in that you need to follow these hardened recommendations? How, how do you bridge that conversation to the executive team? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. The process doesn't work that way at all. Uh, in fact, I, I addressed that in my webinar where I was talking about the community defense model. The, the This is actually a, a big topic that I talk about on CISO forums all the time where, like, if anybody's on the tech tribe, go out there and you can read my writings on it. I'm constantly talking about the, the way, the thing that most MSPs are failing in is they're trying to provide solutions to their customers that they don't understand, they don't want, they don't think they need, and they sure as heck aren't going to pay for. Okay, so coming at it from that direction, which is I'm going to give you these technical controls, 
Okay. That's a, that's a, a formula for failure and alienating your customer and making them very grumpy and unhappy. The approach instead is you start from, you are the executive management team. Fundamentally, you own risk. You cannot delegate risk. Information security risk is no different than legal risk, regulatory risk, financial risk, marketing risk, employee and risk, it's physical an element security of all risk. Of those things. It's exactly right. And and the biggest problem that most executive management teams think is they 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 actually engage in negative self talk and they're like, I'm never going to understand that IT stuff. Wrong. You can understand that IT stuff. What you can't do is you can't delegate that risk management and risk understanding and risk decision making to someone and then abdicate your involvement in it. Because now we don't have governance and now we don't have accountability. Instead, what they've constructed is a situation where they've allowed some dude to have a $50,000 a month credit card limit and he does what he wants. Software on software. I've SSO seen that sign exact, in, it's easy. <laughs> I've seen that exact thing. And I can tell you in the first year of cleaning up the mess after that particular person, I found $300,000 in savings easily. And uh, so no governance, no accountability. So um, pivoting a bit to, I just want to uh, comment on some things that Charity said. I personally believe that if you have to pick a framework, you should pick CIS. Right, because I think that the fundamentals are, why would you try to go do something more advanced if you can't even get your ducks in a row with CIS? Right? Because uh, in, in my webinar, I hate to keep going back to that thing, but I call CIS, um, like I, I call, call it like the sandwich. You know, you basically have these four pillars. You have policy, and then you have, do you even have technical controls? Then are they automated and enforced, and then you have, are you reporting to the business? So now this is your compliance attestation. And I framework it as like, this is a sandwich, right? We got two pieces of bread and we got our meat and vegetables in there and, and we're making this sandwich. So you gotta understand, you can't have a meal until you've got your whole sandwich. And, and so where do we start? We can't boil the ocean. We need to start, go, go get CIS, run your little assessment on yourself, find out how bad your situation is, and 99% of your problems are going to be, oh, we don't have a policy. Well, uh -huh. you better fix that. Start there, because this goes back to what I had just said a bit ago. This is, you can't come at it from this side, like I'm going to shove these technical controls on you. You got to come at it from this side, which is what is the organizational requirements? What is the organizational risk tolerance? What services that we have? What service, what requirements do we have for each service? And that now drives the rest of it because you have to start with that policy. And so, you know, Charity was talking about services. And I just want to bring to everybody's attention that uh, this is a very nuanced topic that those of us that are in the enterprise space, we like totally get this. And it's totally obvious to us. But most people that are not in the enterprise space, it doesn't resonate with them because they really haven't functioned in extremely operationally mature organizations. You know, when I look, when I have discussions with clients about business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, risk management, what technical controls should we have, should we not, what risk do we want to manage? Well, I always start with services. Email is a service. Your internet connection is a service. Can you get to this application is okay. a service. Can I log onto my computer is a service. Can I print is a service. So you have to actually have your customer classify things in that because the only language that they understand is how much heartburn am I going to have when I can't do that? And how right. much heartburn am I going to have the longer time goes on that I can't do that? So it becomes a way of how do you bridge that gap and have those business-centric conversations with your customers to get at the data points that you need to have so that you can give them the technical controls to support their, their outcomes and requirements, which is exactly why on my team I have two CISOs, a CTO, enterprise security architect, and two cybersecurity engineers. Um, I don't have any level two technicians. <laughs> you know? And we, we have you know a CTO and another CISO because how can we deliver solutions to clients that they're going to support, that they understand, that they see the value in, that they see supports their mission, and that they want to pay for if we didn't start from the right end of the spectrum, which is what is their policy on this topic. Now, oh. I'm, I'm curious oh. to respond to that really quick, Rich. Um, you, you talk about 
almost like a discovery conversation. You know, we of course know email is a high need service. Like we know that you're going to go down without that. But intuitively that CEO you're talking to or whoever may not realize it. So it sounds like in that story you shared, MSPs need to almost start at square zero and make them realize how important their technology services are to make them want to secure it. Is that that was my takeaway from no, what you're saying. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go at it that way at all. I, I would say, um, <clears throat> um, what are the services that you have? Let's list those out. Now, how They're long? Out. How long can you live without that functionality? Okay, a great example. Uh, if I'm talking to a law firm in Los Angeles, they could potentially tell me something like, "We're going to miss a fifty thousand. We're going to have a fifty thousand dollar fine if we miss a filing by five minutes." Okay, they've clearly articulated what their uptime requirements are. So if we have to spend $50,000 to make it so that they don't miss that filing, they now have return on investment for that expenditure. You can't go to a tax preparation firm and say, hey, let's put all your stuff in Azure, you know, because they look at that and they're like, I'm sorry, I can't pay $15,000 a month for cloud hosted servers because that's the crazy. I'm not going to get any ROI from that. This is all driven upon how long can the customer survive without that service. I had a client who uh, they had on-premise exchange still, and they wanted us to patch that server at midnight. And I'm like, you are hallucinogenic. Nobody on my team is going to do that at midnight. I said, if we need to do something to that server, the best we're going to give you is 5 p.m. on a Friday. Oh, we can't have that downtime then you have the wrong infrastructure, okay? This is the answer. The answer is not, I'm going to accommodate your bad decision-making practices. The answer is, if you have that kind of uptime requirement, we need to migrate you to Office 365. And that's what we did, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the discussion. And um, so I focus back in on you have to ask the business decision makers to clarify things in terms that are are really their economics, not your economics, their economics, because they really don't care about security. They really don't. Okay. Yeah, There's I, I wanted to just back up a little bit, Felicia. And, you know, it's been a few months since we connected last. And I, I know you have, a, you know, an extremely high velocity schedule and you're, you're advising critical infrastructure. You know, you have a extremely high performance team. How are your, how do you, is your business evolving as, you know, we kind of are in the fourth quarter of 2023 going into 2024? Are, you know, are you, responding to new regulation are you seeing different threats or are you you know kind of more of the same get the basics done so that's really interesting uh, and i'll i'll answer it first starting with we find that organizations are finally and not across the board obviously um, but they're finally understanding that they're in the middle of getting squeezed from both sides. So on one side, they're squeezed because they need a cyber insurance policy. And in order to have that cyber insurance policy, they cannot have they cannot be seen to have committed fraud by lying on that application. Now, when they engage with me, they understand that they really have to take the concepts of like CMMC to heart, even though they may not be a DOD contractor. But there's a concept in CMMC that actually comes from NIST. And it talks about, do you have attestatable proof that was non-tamperably created that proves that what you say you have, you have it. Okay, You need that exact same level of proof when you're talking about cyber insurance. So if your customer contracts over here, if your contracts with your customers say you have to have a certain level of cyber insurance, such as you have to have a $10 million policy. Now over here, you have this cyber insurance policy. Well, we have these things that we have to have in place in order to not be lying on the application. And then you have to maintain that, right? It's a security velocity. If you say this is our patch management policy and we're going to patch things within 30 days, you got to prove that over that 365-day period. You have to keep those records. And, I, and th this cannot be a report that's generated by a human that could have been tampered with 
because then the breach attorney or the plaintiff's attorney or opposing counsel, somebody can make an argument that says, ah, oh, you diddled with that report before you uploaded it to the GRC, which is why we don't use that practice. We ended up building our own GRC that would automatically ingest those attestation reports so that we could be uh, in, that, in that basis. So what I basically see is a bifurcation. I see the companies that are realizing that in order for them to have customer contracts and to not be uh, in a real bad situation, that they are taking their cyber insurance requirements seriously. Okay. And then the other bifurcation is the other side that's like, oh, well, there won't be any enforcement. So we're going to have the internal, <clears throat> the internal accountant do that. And I've actually seen that really bad across the tax preparer space right now is that they're all supposed to be FTC safeguards compliant. And I don't actually think any of them are. Not one. What I continue to see them to do is like, oh, well, we're going to take an internal person and write a written information security plan. And it's pure, utter fiction and theater. And there's no alignment between any policy that they create and any of the technical controls or attestation. So they're basically lying on their cyber, their cyber applications. And if the FTC or the IRS ever audited them, oh, it'd be down in flames, flaming and flaming. And then here's the part that really sets me off and then I'll shut up about this. <laughs> I was talking to um, some tax preparers and they're like, well, we, we can't come up with the money for that. And I said, look, I actually did a budget for you. And in that budget analysis, if you would charge each one of your customers that you do tax prep for, another $75 per year, you would finance all of your compliance. So are you seriously going to tell me that you can't make an argument to your customers that you're going to charge them an additional $75 per year? We're not talking about $75 per month. We're talking about $75 a year. Come on, let's get real. So, so I, I want I want to give Charity, because we brought out FTC safeguards, so we can't just bypass this topic. I imagine Charity has her own experience um, working on this and potentially some insight on what CIS maybe has in the pipeline. Um, but Charity, I'd, I'd love for you to take over a little bit. No, no, it, it, it's, it's good. Um, so I wanted to back up just a little bit. Um, and so I would like to fully endorse Felicia's full endorsement of CIS. So... <laughs> takeaway okay <laughs> I, need, I need for that to be heard um no um it, even going back to um i think felicia and i share a lot of the same mindset on it just coming from a, a slightly different lens on on how to lead the charge for not checking the box and looking at emerging trends I feel like from my perspective and, and in my experience that um, it, it, call, it all comes down to the same rinse and repeat. And I think Felicia mentioned this earlier as well. It's really relationship management um, as far as having a good understanding of what the strategic goals, business driven decisions are um, from the top of the house. And then, um, you know, understanding where your role is, whether it's governance or CISO or, um, you know, just a manager of technology services or the technology um, service catalog and just understanding um, where where the company is going and how to get there because I can tell you from experience having been through multiple mergers those change you know it might seem like all banking no you know there's commercial bank versus a retail bank versus a state chartered bank versus a nationally accredited bank and um, I really did have to get very very good at understanding the environment or the ecosystem that supported IT understanding that governance is that handshake between IT and business value and being able to um, to kind of showcase that, you know, um, with that relationship management and then utilizing, of course, our, our key buzzwords, right, in risk management. It's reputational risk. It's uh, regulatory risk. And I know that we established that all of those things are still risk management at the heart of it. Um, but truly, if that's where the company would like to go, you know, maybe the maybe the goal is we would like to grow the company, company XYZ. It doesn't have to be a bank um, organically in the next um, um, 18 months by 20%. Okay, well, how are we going to execute that? You're sure as hell not going to execute it with, you know, having breaches or um, losing your cybersecurity insurance or, you know, having um, multiple downtimes or disgruntled associates or, you know, customers. So um, I think that a lot of a lot of the things that we're saying kind of rings true between Felicia and I um, both. So. So, hey, uh, quick, uh, quick shout out to uh, Kayla, the Devo CISO, hitting the chat. She was our guest last week. Welcome, Kayla. Thanks for joining in. 
Awesome. So, Ch Charity, you said governance is a handshake between IT and did you say the mission of the business? So um, between IT and the business, it can be the mis mission or the business objectives just depends on the size. So I, I think that that's like one of the most important things that's been said here so far. And I articulate my relationship with clients as the business partner of the business yeah. that IT has can't be the business prevention unit. Exactly. Right. So instead of me saying, no, we can't do that, I'd be like, talk to me about what you're trying to do. Talk to me about what your problems are. And once I understand what you're trying to do, now I can offer you up. Let's do A. Let's do B. Perfect. Why don't Why don't you try both and let's see which one works for you best in your business process? Because either A or B, they're both secure enough and we're okay with them. Right. Right. In that aspect, we are, you know, the solutions architect at the same time, right? We're providing the secure solution to support the business decision. Yep. Yep. And, and when you're not the business prevention unit uh, and you make their life better, then that dialogue stays open. And information security is always seen as prevention. So, you know, it's just kind of one of those stigmas we have to <laughs> work through. I work really hard at making it cool and sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> I'll need bring notes him, on that because to cybersecurity. <laughs> I'll need notes on how to how to transition to the cool and sexy part of configuration management. But speaking of configuration management, we do have a topic to get into as well today, everyone. So let's dive into some of these legacy settings um, that Microsoft still comes in as default configurations, which, as we saw from some recent articles from CISA, NSA. Default configurations are that number one attack vector. Valicia echoed that today. I mean, it, it's something we all need to handle. So let's um, go ahead and pop open the slides um, to kick off. Um, I'll leave it to Felicia. I have a cat that we're just talking about, but um, it's throwing me off. It just jumped on front of my desk. I can't see my screen, but that's okay. Um, Felicia, I listed out some of these MITRE attack techniques. Um, CIS benchmarks are gonna mitigate the risk of any of these being successful. And I was hoping you could just kind of talk towards some of these and just share what they are. Yeah, and and I I also want to say that like I I you know the number one most effective CIS benchmark is secure configuration management, okay? And um that is an art form. It's an art form. And that that's the challenge, right? Is is how do you get um secure configuration management art form you know effectuated throughout the organization. You know, unauthorized access is I think very simple. Right, it, but you have to you have to bifurcate. You have to say we have physical issues and then we have digital issues. And you got to if you don't have an inventory of something, you sure as heck can't you can't secure it. You can't secure what you don't know you have. So when I go to a client and say, "Hey, where's your asset management system?" They're like, "Wait, don't you do that?" No, it ain't my job to do your asset management. <laughs> You know, like, you know, so well, why do we have to do that? Oh, you know, and then, then, then I give them my white paper. <laughs> I give them a white well, paper I wrote on that. Let, let, let's, let's expand on that a little bit more, Felicia. I mean, MSPs bring on new clients all the time and they have no idea what they're walking into. So getting the lay of the land with just the assets, of course, square zero, you have to well, do it. But well, but this is a shared responsibility model. That's the problem. That's the mm -hmm. biggest key issue here is, is look, I said, I talked about this before. I said, you know, you have every executive management team that's out there. They want to hire somebody and delegate the responsibility and risk to them. And then they want to abdicate their involvement, right? They want to just do it like they do with, you know, the window contractor, like, Hey, replace this window for me. But that is a, you know, replace this window for me can be transactional. It can also be a strategic thing. You may need to actually have a very strong set of requirements that you're communicating effectively to your window contractor. When you're talking about digital risk management and what is at stake in information security risk management, this whole abdicate, delegate and abdicate thing, it is such dead horse business tactics. It needs to be taken out back, whipped flog and light on fire. It is an approach that doesn't work. It will never work. I've never seen it work. I've been in this industry for 30 years. It's just never going to work. You have to have executive management teams that at least make an effort to focus on one decision at a time and make that informed risk decision. And part of these fundamental concepts that they have to understand is we can't secure what we don't have an inventory of and that this whole relationship is a shared responsibility model. 
right? This isn't just you get to chuck grenades over the fence at us. This is not how it goes because I'll throw the grenades back at you. Okay. No, this is a matter of we have to come together desiring to have an open and honest collaborative relationship. And there is a shared responsibility model. So with my clients, we actually use collaboratively Asset Tiger. Asset Tiger is free. It's also fantabulous. It has beautiful asset tags and it puts every customer in a position to where they've got their own owned. So they own it. Right. And it's their individual tenant uh, in Asset Tiger. Didn't cost them anything to have it. And they just make us an account in there and we can collaborate with them on that. And now we have operational maturity in that aspect. And then we have some co-managed IT. We have direct clients and it works very well in both cases. But like that's part of that articulation, what is the shared responsibility model? And I don't think that most MSPs or IT service providers across the board, they do not articulate well what the shared responsibility model is. I, I would, I mean, I work with MSPs every day and I think that's one of the first times I've heard that perspective. It sounds like in your audience you work with, you really want to empower them to take advantage of the security, take take ownership even. Is, is that what you're trying to do? Well, I mean, you know, you're going to hear me harp on CIS incessantly. What is pillar four? Pillar four is the people in the business have to be making informed understandings about what's actually happening in their business. How on earth do you know that the patch management services that you're paying for are actually working? Well, somebody in the business needs to be looking at the stinking reports. Otherwise, all you're doing is chucking things over the grenade, you know, over the fence, chucking the grenades over there, and you're hoping they don't come back and explode at you. You know, is this governance and accountability? Somebody's got to look at those reports. It's a shared responsibility model. It, you know, I, like I don't want to have this situation where we have an incident, and then somebody comes back and is like. Oh, but but we we thought you said blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, no, you don't get to play the blame game. You're at this table and you're going to be part of the solution or just get out of Dodge. It's your business. I can't care more about your business than you do. Yeah. Yeah. And Charity, I would I would love for you to kind of talk towards that as well, because Felicia and I, we have this, um, you know, third party IT management point of view. That's who we work with. You, you've been on that executive team, like directly as part of the business, not just shared. You were. What, what's your thoughts on right. Felicia's point of view? Yes, um, um, two, 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 um, two points really um, going back to um, the asset inventory. Absolutely. And as luck would have it, that is CIS control number one, um, establish and maintain an asset inventory. Um, and I've actually in um, legacy positions, right, from a process governance and accountability perspective, have gone through and done asset management as a practice um, assessments right for exactly that reason you know if you pluck something out of the um, fdic or the ffiec guidelines that say how are you managing critical assets and you know i think this is to your point felicia too i go in and say that as a process governance team and they're like i don't know charity what constitutes it being critical I'm like it's not my asset it's yours <laughs> So um, going through and, 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 and that is really what I do like about the CIS controls is the safeguards that support them are actionable, prescriptive measures, right? Um, in a one, two, three, four, five format, right? Um, that would be exactly that, that you could have those conversations. And I fully agree, depending upon an enterprise's size, it's not going to be just the responsibility of IT procurement to manage all IT assets. They can report on it that this didn't check in or this seems to be deprecated um, or this is a foreign asset that we need to account for or this hasn't been patched in plug a number of time, however, you know, much you want to freak out. Um, but it's not necessarily their responsibility to um, understand the asset where it sits and that the in that it exists. So um, in a previous role, um, we had to build out that program entirely, right? And everybody wanted to throw up when I told them about having a racy for it, you're responsible <laughs> for this, you're just accountable for this, like get out of here with your governance language charity, we don't care. Um, and it was down to this person is going to be in trouble if this fails <laughs> this person cannot recover their data if this asset fails <laughs> so we that is shared it. responsibility <laughs> right 
Right. So we had to, you know, take that shared model approach as far as, you know, um, and, and really guide them through that from a governance and accountability perspective. You're responsible for X, Y, Z. And really, we built a training program out of it so that they would understand it. And then they, they could train their people because we're talking about IT shops with, you know, 500 to 1000 folks. So you're not just going to have two people running it. Well, Bob's got this one and Susie's got this one. Right. You know, it's, it was just much bigger than that. Yeah, I, I want to pivot on that one, that a key component of this asset management, asset inventory is defining who the resource owner is. Let me give you a really practical example of this. 100%. I was looking at, uh, was taking over the network basically for a, um, basically a church, fairly large organization. And the former IT service provider was um, grossly inadequate is my most polite description. I've used Suffice that before too. <laughs> Suffice to say, the uh, the HVAC system was completely free willy open to the world. Now, this was right along the time frame that we had been hearing of these news reports of hackers gaining uh, unauthorized access to HVAC systems that had been exposed to the Internet. And they just basically credential uh, stuffed or, you know, brute forced that system and gained access to it. And then they they modified it and revved up the motors and, you know, basically blew out the equipment and lit the building on fire. Yeah, a little bit of a problem, you know. And and so I was bringing this up to a client and saying to them, um, you know, I'd really like to mitigate this risk of the HVAC system completely exposed to the Internet because I'm concerned about hackers building fires and so forth. OK, well, the facilities director got very emotional and um, didn't want to have the inconvenience of having any restrictions of access to it whatsoever was completely incapable and unwilling of defining who should actually have legitimate access to it. And I'm like, do you control the keys? Who has keys to that building or that room in that building? Yeah, this is no different than that. Right. Like, does it make your life more convenient to just have everybody in the world have a key to that room? I don't think it does. <laughs> you know? like, and, and the problem was because the organization didn't have enough operational maturity, the facilities director basically went and whined to uh, executive leadership and executive leadership did not go back to that person and say, guess what? You are the resource owner. Therefore, this is your responsibility in a shared responsibility model. No, instead, that person says, this is an IT problem. And I'd be like, Hey, if it's if you won't make it an IT, an IT problem, I will make it an IT problem for you. You give it to me in writing and you define for me that I am the resource owner of that mm -hmm. asset. You put that in writing. Oh, I guarantee you I'll fix the problem. You know, you're not going to like what I do, but I'm going to fix the problem. Right. So this is why it has to be a shared responsibility model. And you have to start with defining those resource owners and services classification, what's our risk tolerance for each service. You know, you're gonna have different retention policies, different data right. encryption policies, depending upon what the resource is. I mean, it's all over the board. I mean, if anybody mm -hmm. said that this is easy, it's insane. No, no, no. This is like, I think what, what we do is harder than brain surgery. And I'm not taking anything away from brain surgeons, but brain surgeons are working in, in a space where they're not having to integrate uh, massive amounts of input from all kinds of things that are dynamically changing every minute of every day. So yeah, a lot of resource those owners, lines, right? With resource <laughs> resource owners, when you were saying that, that's really where the IT service catalog came out of necessity, right? It had to be in writing. Who owned it? You know, who's the service owner? Who's the service administrator? And you can slice and dice that to make it as complex or not as you wanted, but we would build that from a governance perspective around, okay, if these are the services that you own, step one was you own all attests. <laughs> now, let me tell you what ownership means. And um, it actually ended up being a really cool um, resource, not only just, you know, you, you can't manage what you don't know you have, right? That, that That's true with anything, but we would build policy around it, right? This is the IT service that we are guaranteeing, and this is the policy that supports that, all the way to resource management, right? Capacity management. So I could take us way off topic, and I won't do that, Zach. I'm back. I, yeah, I think that the there's a huge misperception out there that says that these things that we're talking about 
are only applicable at the enterprise level. I get this all the time on the tech tribe. You know, people are like, oh, Felicia, that only applies. And I'm like, I just call BS on that because I do that level of operational maturity stuff for my single user retired librarian clients. I swear to God, they yeah. actually, my single user retired customers have enterprise grade security. They have an asset management system. They have asset tax. <laughs> they have a resource owner definition. We have classification plans for them because it's not really that hard to do it. In fact, I would argue that the opposite direction is that the smaller the business, the easier it is to solve the problem. It is, absolutely. All That's right. Amazing. Felicia, we are going to put you on the hot seat. We have okay. 15 minutes left and we have 12 settings to cover. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Let's go. So we're going to hop into this first setting here. Um, and again, these are all legacy Microsoft settings. So a lot of these are going to say disabled or have them highly secure. So kick it okay. off with this first one, Felicia. Enable um, automatic logon, not recommended, set so, to disabled. So there's only one context in which I would ever recommend utilizing this setting. And first off, I would argue that 99.999% uh, of the case, you can absolutely just implement this with without ever even taking two other breaths. Just do it without hesitation. There's one circumstance that uh, I would ever utilize this, and it's to uh, overcome the limitations in crapware. Um, crapware is software that was invented, that it is uh, incapable of running as a service on a Windows machine, and instead the only way that it functions is if an application loads in an interactive session and does things, and that is crapware, full stop. And so the solution to that is get off of crapware. Um, but that would be the only place where I would use that. Okay, next. <laughs> so if you have disruption, it's crapware. Make sure you harden this setting because it's not worth the risk. Going That's into right. this next one, <laughs> disable IP source routing, IPv6. We hear about IPv6 quite often. Educate the audience. This is um, high level. So what is this? Why do we recommend this setting? So IPv6 can, I mean, okay, let's, let's first start, let's first establish a fact that there isn't a single company that I'm aware of that actually legitimately needs IPv6 on their LAN. Not, not one, not one, not HP, not IBM. I mean, they might be using it. Okay. But do we really, really need it on the LAN? No. Okay. Can you disable it on your servers? Absolutely. Can you disable it on your workstations? Well, not so much because Microsoft basically made it to where edge and internet browsing would blow up in your face if you disabled IPv6. So now this leaves you in a position of needing to put some hardening on IPv6 because you can't just completely whack it. So in this case, this particular setting is a very good setting and um, there's no negative impact to doing it, so just do it. Perfect. Love, love that. You're already killing the rapid fire. So next one here, prevent dial up password from being saved. I read dial dial up and I immediately think old and not needed. Am I right with this thought? Um, anything where you are preventing a password from being saved is what I would call basic standard 101. And uh, one of the things that you have to do with security in terms of like hardening is you have to look at okay, what's going to be the impact to the organization? And if there isn't going to be an impact to the organization, then just try and, you know, sneak that in there and sneak it in there with, uh, you know, some good change control. You don't necessarily have to go crazy with trying to get somebody's permission to put it in there. Just be very careful about your change control document. You did this setting at this date and time. And, you know, sometimes you got to wait to make sure nothing blows up in your face. Um, but something that's like a dial-up, password setting, and, and actually I would argue just disabling passwords straight up. Uh, I would pivot to that to say that one of the biggest risk mitigations you can do nowadays is to configure all of the browsers such that they're incapable of using the browser-centric password manager. Super bad, gotta kill that. Okay, next. Love that tidbit, <laughs> let's get into it. So enable ICMP redirects to override OSPF generated routes. It's a couple terms right. here, I don't think that all the audience will understand, so high level. Well, basically anything that's attempting to screw around with the route for your traffic is is attempting to do like a man in the middle attack on it or, yes. you know, some other sort of attack on it. And, you know, it's it's in effect just falsifying what should be the truth. And so therefore, if we have a technical control that enables the computer to uh, safeguard against something that has the opportunity to falsify the truth in its communications, well, then you need to turn that on. So um, in this case, the setting is disabled. Perfect. 
All right, I think we're making time. We're doing amazing, Felicia. <laughs> keep alive time. How often keep alive packets are sent in milliseconds? Um, um, this set this is a great ahead. this is a great setting. I mean, this is one of those things where you wonder what the hell was Microsoft even thinking? Um, <clears throat> but you you know you pivot off of this and say, what's our fundamental thing that we need to do with workstations? Um, I think you know defaults on servers are different, but defaults on workstations they want these things to go to nappy time. If your if your workstations are going nappy time, they don't patch. They don't maintain, they don't compliance scan, they don't vulnerability scan, they don't do any of those things. So when you first build a computer as part of your secure configuration management, you've got to kill sleep. Must kill sleep settings, just kill them. Okay. It's important to be passionate in the security field too, otherwise we're not gonna get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, this is a great setting. Uh, I go with the recommended there. That's good. Awesome. All right. This next one here. Allow the computer to ignore NetBIOS name release requests, except from when servers. NetBIOS, um, anything releasing name sounds scary to me. So, I mean, NetBIOS in general, please let it burn in hell. Um, you know, and NetBIOS should be dead on pretty much every network that's out there already. So with this setting, I would have zero hesitation uh, turning it on to enabled. It should have absolutely no impact whatsoever because basically WINS has been dead for a very long time and much of NetBIOS has been dead for a very long time as well. Perfect. That's why we're in the legacy settings um, section of the CIS <laughs> benchmarks. Please follow this entire episode and do this in your environment. <laughs> All right, I, I, IRDP um, to detect and configure default gateway addresses. Um, we hate default everything. Go ahead. I, I really, I think this is, I could make the same argument I made with anything that's going to tamper with your route. This is basically tampering with uh, the default gateway, right? So we need to protect against things that are going to tamper with that. You need to tell your computer that this is where the truth comes from and the other stuff is malicious. So reducing the, the attack surface, right? The points of vulnerability. Right. Yep. Awesome. All right. We got safe DLL search mode um, set to enabled. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> do we need to cover this but, slide? <laughs> do, do you know, I mean, look, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pivot from, first of all, is there ever a circumstance when you would want to accept a DLL from an unsafe location or from an unapproved location? I think not. I mean, don't we know about the the purpose of WQHL drivers, right? I mean, things are, things are supposed to be signed. They're supposed to have certificates. They're supposed to be part of a chain of trust. Otherwise, you just you know allow I don't know an, a DLL side loading injection attack to occur. Um, really, any sort of really competent modern contemporary endpoint protection software that uses zero trust threat protection and is appropriately secure configuration hardened would kill this anyways. But so th this is one of those things where there's zero negative impact to having that setting. So you might as well. And honestly, you're making great time. So I'm going to toss in an extra question at you. Um, you know, these CIS benchmarks are all about this preventative measures. And you're talking about MITRE attack techniques throughout this episode, um, which we did skip that slide. But just talk about why these preventative configurations are able to prevent such basic MITRE attacks. Oh, um, you know, the biggest the biggest way that I describe these sorts of things is is if you have the opportunity to uh, take something and basically you rip away the door. OK, the door used to be there, but now you're going to go cling on stealth ship on it like, wow, there's no door anymore. You know, like packet cannot get there. Um, you just rip the door away. OK, now that is a vulnerability. It doesn't exist anymore because you ripped the door away. And most of the time, these fundamentals are something that's a one-time effort. You don't have to monitor anymore other than just verifying that the setting is still in effect. And if you have like a policy enforcement tool um, that would automatically look for that setting, and if it's out of variance from what it should be, it puts the setting back. So you have like, you know, policy enforcement mechanism, whatever approach you choose to use for that. Um, the fact is that you need to do that. That will also um, decrease your computer uh, deployment time as well, because now you just enroll it with that agent on it. Ba-bam! You get magic where the hardened configuration is there. It also makes you much more resilient to doing any level of audits or compliance assessments like, you know, this is our system and we know 
that these settings are in effect and we get these reports and we check this uh, and we have these policies in place where we ensure that 100% of our computers have this agent on there uh, and our monthly processes we verify that all of the computers that we have in our inventory, we see that they have the ag agent in there and if we're supposed to have 2052 here, we have 2052 here. Okay. Attesting to it and proving it for cyber insurance or if you ever need to do a post breach, solid. Thanks for letting me toss that in there. All right, one another setting here. Um, the time in seconds before screensaver grace period expires. Okay, this one is the one where I'm going to tell you that this is a bogus setting. And I'm going to tell you this is a bogus setting because um, it's just not contextually sensitive enough. So I have a physical office and I have physical security of that office. And I am very frequently on the phone for 45 minutes straight. Do I really want my computer going screen lockout while I'm in the middle of a meeting on a telephone call? No, that doesn't help me at all. It doesn't help my productivity. Am I mitigating a risk by having that setting in place? No, not really, because I've established a different control. That control is physical security to that asset. I also have human policies that anyone who even gets near my computer shall be bludgeoned. So um, now let's take a look at a medical situation. You very well may have a doctor who needs to look at like medical imaging x-rays in the middle of a procedure. If I swear that doctor is going to come and behead you if you make it so that they have to take their hands off of their patient and go move a mouse or something in order to keep it. And that's probably not even hygiene. You know, that's like against hygiene. You yep. can be like sticking it in somebody's brain and then on the computer like that doesn't work. So the screen, screensaver timeout is highly contextual. Quick question. Is your physical policy for humans only? I hope it doesn't include bunnies. Bunnies are also not allowed access to the keyboard because they really get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> bunnies know how to use the delete button. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Perfect. All so, right, we got. So, anyways, I I think that the screensaver timeout is one that you really need to have a company policy on because it's very very contextual to that organization. All right, three and, settings, three yeah. minutes, Felicia. You got one more comment on that? Uh, no, go for it. All right, we got. Uh, how many times unacknowledged data is retransmitted, okay. set okay. to enabled? Mm -hmm. This is just basic TCP/IP 101. Uh, there are literally TCP SYNAC attacks that can happen by um, screwing around with packets being delivered and returned out of order. So you have to tell a computer to like cut that off at some point in time, or you're basically leaving the computer open for a DDoS attack. So please just don't do that, right? Use the, use the recommended setting. Perfect. And then this, this setting here um, looks basically the same here. I'm actually... Uh... I think I have the same slide twice for you, Felicia. No, no it's nope. not. They're, no, they're two different things, but it's the same concept. So you can move on. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Sorry about that. All right. And then this last setting here, um, percentage threshold for the security event okay. log at which, go ahead. Yeah, th this one's also <laughs> baloney. Okay, and the reason that this one is baloney, let's just take an exchange server, for example. I give that exchange server approximately six hours before the security log is, is going to fill up. Has it helped me whatsoever to get a, uh, an alert that the security log is 90% full? Oh, hell no. Okay, what's the first thing that bad guys do when they gain access to a computer? <laughs> Goodbye logs. <laughs> Goodbye logs, right? So what are we actually trying to accomplish here? First, we have to have a paradigm that says we're going to actually capture our logs with something and send them someplace. Um, just as an FYI, WEC, which is Windows Event Collection, is totally not effective in any organization from a technological perspective other than enterprise in a single Active Directory domain. All right, so, so WEC has no usefulness in the MSP space whatsoever. What you should be doing is looking for like an EPDR agent system that, that captures 365 days worth of that telemetry data and is feeding it into a SOAR with active uh, intelligence and threat hunting built on it, which I use WatchGuard EPDR, which is formerly Panda Security. And when you use that product, it's uh, it's incredibly effective. Um, <clears throat> so you can, in effect, have like 365 days worth of SIM logging uh, f fed into a SOAR. However, there's other ways to do that. You could get like Blue Myra, um, which would be yep. an agent on the endpoint, would suck in the logs. And again, it's going into a SOAR with intelligence. But Right after hell freezes over, am I going to want a stupid alert from a server that I know is going to be filling up every six hours? Like that—that's not helping me. 
That's not helping me. I'd say we made it, Felicia. We got 50 seconds even at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was incredible. Thanks for the speed round. Um, Very well done. I think I think there's definitely plenty of questions. Um, I don't want to run too much over, but I do want to give Charity a chance. Um, anything you want to add additionally to any of Felicia's comments? I'm happy to run a few minutes over. No, um, the, the comments were excellent. Um, I think I think the speed round went very well as well. Um, great job, Felicia. Um, the, the only thing that I would shamelessly plug for CIS controls is um, control number four, which is establish and maintain a secure configuration process. You know, I've spoken a lot about process and process governance, and that goes directly to that. So um, our engineering team has created a document that is free um, to any anyone that wanted to look at it um, around the configuration process process itself and then the safeguards that are applicable and what that is um, mitigating. So um, oh, I love that. Where's the links? Where's the links? <laughs> I, I, will, I, I am getting it to you. I think I only have access to private chat, but I can get it to you. Got it. Yeah, we, we can um, toss it into the LinkedIn um, live chat as well. Um, so we'll do that after the episode. Um, and just as a shameless plug for ourselves, you know, Sentian is here to help implement all of these settings as well with the change logs, gap assessments, and everything in that vein. But um, absolutely great speed line, Felicia. Um, not enough time for the preempt q and I had set up, so that is all good. We may have to do another episode with you. <laughs> um, I think so. But any concluding thoughts from you, Felicia, before I wrap up? Fundamentals 101, stop chasing the shiny objects look at things on a prioritized basis in terms of return on security investment and just address the top five controls and safeguards that are in the CIS community defense model. I think it's page 12 that has like a pivot table and it says these are the ones that you get your biggest bang from the buck right there. And until you get those things locked in, just you got to lock that in. If you don't have that locked in, just stop playing games on other issues. Just stop. To, 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 further, to further augment that statement, this is essential cyber hygiene, meaning implementation group one and the safeguards yes. that support that. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for being here. So just as a concluding um, slides here, we are here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. We try to cover 10 to 12 slide uh, settings every single week and uh, bring an SME guest. So Felicia, absolute blast. Charity, thanks for joining us. Um, in the future, just as a heads up, um, Charity will be joining us a few more times for a parallel series. Um, we wanna have a series talking about how these CIS benchmarks link back up to the controls and fit into these implementation groups a little bit more in depth than the granular settings. So I guess more high level than the granular settings. But you know, um, it'd be really fun would be to do uh... Um, to go through a process of a CIS assessment because I've got a process I use with clients where I can, in less than two hours, do a full CIS assessment on them. Wow, on the, I like on the that, client. Felicia. That's and a great and if, idea. You can, if you can do it that fast, you can rip away the objections of like, no, I don't want to pay for the expensive assessment. And it's like, really? You don't have enough money for two hours of my time? <laughs> we have a lot of free tools for control assessment. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and shameless plugs, Sentian also offers free gap assessments um, just as quick too. So there's plenty of opportunity and free resources that yep. I right. want MSPs just to take advantage of. Utilize this as part of your sales cycle, right? Show them the risk they have, show them your value, and then you can remediate that whether it's manually or with a tool, but present these assessments to prove that you're needed, right? So. Anyway, we're going in too deep into this, but um, next week um, we do have Chris Johnson from CompTIA joining the show. Um, still working on finding a guest to talk about printers. Every MSP I've talked to, man, they want any topic but printers. I'll take printers. <laughs> we'll be back in a couple weeks then, Felicia. <laughs> Felicia's not shy. But, um, and then we got Roddy coming back on um, in November. So appreciate you being here. And just with this concluding side, we are happy to all connect. I think all of our LinkedIn's are in the chats. Um, Sentian does offer a free NFRs for, for MSPs. Do your assessments, use CIS resources. It is all valuable and you get the same end result. So very cool guys. Thank you for being here and see you next week.